Hello, my name's Tris, and this is Double O'Neill. Today, we're going to look at a 14XX that I picked up at the Doncaster Model Railway Show. It was second hand, obviously, it's an old model now, and looking at it, it could do with, I feel, some upgrades, and I know a few things that I could do. But initially looking at it, I did notice some other issues, which I'll go through with you in a bit more detail. Looking at certain bits of it, you wonder, well, why wasn't the chimney painted? Uh, it's kind of this dark nickel colour, so that could do with painting up. And there's lots of other little details, for example, the smoke box door that's moulded in, all these little moulded parts sitting on it, which we could replace with brass parts and metal parts. The rest of it seems alright, but the rear wheels are sticking out quite a lot and got quite a hard spring on it and as you'll see in some coming clips there is a small issue there you get a bit of a bounce I decided to take it down to my father's railway which you might recognize and put it down and you can instantly see the center wheels picking up there and as you poke it you just think this can't have been like all of them are, otherwise they'd all have that issue, right? <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's not very good. And so I'll demonstrate when we run it, the front wheels do all the driving and that's just not good. Not very impressed, even just moving under its own weight. You can see, look, it's, it's slipping. That's ridiculous. So either someone replaced it with a really hard spring or that's how it came. So I find it hard to believe that Hornby would have allowed them to come out like this so I'm wondering if I've either got some freak spring on there or yeah it's just how it is but running the engine along it it, it will run um, you have to just get it going it's just one wheel drive or two wheel drive at the moment but it's a pretty loco running around the layout it's always nice got the auto coaches that my father had and yeah it's going along but you can still see small slipping from the front tires or wheels from time to time and yeah it's not much we can really do about that but it is a nice looking loco okay, that yeah i'm looking forward to doing up i want to paint it up in great western green and that's what we'll be doing on this video and i've been really looking forward to doing this because there's loads of options for this i talked to my dad about it and he explained the various options for me to do but as for its running, hopefully we can improve it. I will modify it. Um, well, I'm thinking just shorten that spring. That should do the job. And yeah, should be nice. But maybe in the future I'll bring it back to my father's layout and we'll have a run round when it's all fixed. Um, but this video will be focused on the upgrading. This is my dad's one that he's got. It's an old FX one, I believe. And he's been doing bits of work on it but this has got a different brass chassis on it which is I honestly find really wonderful and what you'll see is it's got compensation so you push down the center wheels and the rear wheels come up and push the rear wheels down and the center ones come up this means all six of the wheels will sit on the chassis and yeah always be in contact which is excellent he used another pair of the driving wheels from another donor chassis to get this going but to get hold of chassis and things for cheap prices doesn't happen he also removed the collection points from the tanks to the boiler so i'll be doing that on mine as well he also kindly showed me his dj models um, loco which was by hattons um well hattons obviously sold it exclusively to hattons model railways and it's a lovely detailed loco and it doesn't have any bounce when you touch it the wheels have nice lateral movement it seems to be a well thought out model and it looks really really nice of course i couldn't find one of these you try and find these online i can't well i've not found one so far i try and pick one up in great western green so then i have more of them but this one looks good and i've used it for like more of a reference as well as my books that i have looking in the books is very helpful because you can see obviously what things look like back then uh, i don't have current reference to look at just having a little glance at the instruction sheets i now want to get minor parts how do i get it off and it's all through the chimney so there's a tiny screw which the chimney acts like a little washer to trap it down and then we get the chassis out looking at the chassis it's all one big cast item which is nice so that's why we've got lots of weight on there but i want to get the bottom half of it apart so then i can get to that spring i did wonder what 
mechanism I was going to get to. The only reason I talk about springs is because obviously I'm talking about this video after I've done it. But getting the wheel set out, which it rubs on the whole time, it's... I don't know, I feel, feel like it's quite crude, but I guess it's the old design. Um, I get this spring, and all I do is I snip off a few of the coils to make it a bit shorter. It will naturally make it harder, but it's got less preload when it happens. So I give that a snip. I kind of go and mangle the ends of my clippers to do this. But they're my older set, so I thought this is, fig <laughs> this is fine. Anyway, putting it back in replace it as I put it back in. If any of you pick one of these up, let me know if it's got the same issue. And it'd be interesting to see what the old Daypole, Airfix, GMR ones are like. Because you look at the books and it looks like it's all used the same bits. But my dad chassis had the drive shaft from the Daypole ones. I might be wrong in saying that. And it did look different. But anyway, whilst I was here, it was really dirty, I noticed. So I thought I'll clean up these wheels. And you can see just how dirty these are on the inside um, from where it's been touching the pickups and everything you always wonder um, like because I know my locos are this dirty and, and I like to run them around I enjoy them and sometimes I always wonder if people just plaster oil all over everything to go yep it's fine um, the wheels don't run as well on the driving sets but the rear two wheels run really really well but on the layout it seemed to be fine so I picked up this mainly trains um, detailing set um, you can look on wizard models and you can find this i'm not going to use all of the bits but you'll see here there's a instruction sheet which is going to show you how to do this um, as well as you know what, what you can add on so they offer you a chimney and all these other bits i don't end up using the chimney because the chimney that is on it i felt was fine uh, i can't really see much difference between the two and as I have to put a screw down it, I'd rather keep it. So this chimney isn't really going to be it. But just eyeing it up, it would mean I need to take the flange off that's already on that smoke box top. But I will use, though, is this brass safety valve. Looking in the books, it kind of gives you good reference. I feel that, you know, the more I'm getting into this hobby, these books are so valuable. And you can pick some of these books up for like £1.50 or £1 or even free if you know you've got a friend or family member that's got these things going so use them for reference so looking at it i want to use this safety valve um it looks better it's a little bit more squat wider at the bottom and i can also polish it up on the lathe if i need to but i first start out by removing the smoke box doors and i had actually started out by using my scalpel blade but that wasn't working so i used the file and i just be patient and i take it down until you've got it nice and smooth. I'm going to glue the smoke box door on and that's just quite simply using some thick super glue and then I go and stick it on just trying to make sure it's in the right position to make sure that it's in the center of it. I don't want it sitting offset and suddenly it looks terrible and then it's like that for life and that's something that I won't spot given <laughs> time I'd always see it so that's on there i just want to redrill the hole that's above for the like the offsets handlebar mounts i forget the name of them but these little standoffs that go on there so let's take a look at the manual my dad kindly lent me these not the manual but the the catalogs from back in the day so this is the airfix catalog which is quite wonderful and you can see the nice drive shaft area of the one inside the airfix and looking inside you've got a great western option and you'll be our option. You can actually see the Romford wheels being used on the prototype. And my dad pointed it out to me. So I thought that was great. Um, so they guess they hadn't got their production ones ready. So that was kind of cool. Then there's GMR. Which I thought was kind of cool. Um, again I guess they brought FX or, or whatever. Um, or the other way around. And you can see their options there. You've got Great Western Railway there. Um, as well as the BR livery again. And then you got Daypole. And you go in here, or Dapol, everyone says it differently. Don't you know which way is the right way. But in here, there's three liveries. And you have the shirt button, as well as British Railways as well, which is kind of cool. And then um, British Railways in the black. So I quite like the British Railways ones in the green. Always looks really, really nice. But that's been nice to look at. But we'll focus on my model, which we're going to get rid of all of the flash lines from when it's been moulded. Um, 
these are very annoying normally when you've got a model which you've paid a lot of money for and this simple process of removing the little flash lines haven't been done and uh, it's more and more of a pet peeve for me because it's like a really easy thing to do so I rip off that safety valve so that's out of the way and then I take out the whistles I've then also chopped off the baffle plate from the whistle um, and then snipping off the collector um, bits that go from the boiler um, or from the side tanks to the boiler using a scalpel blade I then remove all the areas that are sitting proud and I try and do it in a way that we end up having a nice smooth surface as well as that the molded on little handle bars that are on the side and the rear we've also got the fire, um, the irons for the lamps um, so or the lamp mounts um, I could pick the right names it always help I'm going to be um, adding some fire irons on afterwards which would be cool so then we can have a big is it a spade shovel or whatever after this I'm drilling some holes to then put the handlebars back in and I'll use some 0.3 nickel wire to bend around and we'll put them back in place and they kind of went okay <laughs> I didn't really get them as straight as I wanted to afterwards I realized that they weren't looking particularly straight but fine we make mistakes and maybe that's something I don't spot with in future times um, but it seems to look nice on the finished article anyway but you'll see that towards the end and then using a little kit um, which is from Comet Models which is LS74 we fit the whistle guard which I guess it blows the the, the whistle sound you know when the blast comes out blasts it forwards and projects it better I don't know and then using Silver Tay's little sprue um, I call it a sprue but a little brass etch you can then um, basically clip out your little bits and we're going to fit on the the irons that hold the um, the shovel um, as well as the lamp irons um, so they're quite simple you bend them to shape you glue them on they're very nice actually there's a lot of detail on them and that's the beauty of it and I feel really grateful for being able to get hold of these the Silver Tay models items I get them off eBay I don't think they have a website um, but I got on eBay to get everything but you can see them all fitted here and they look smart they, they really do bring something extra to it I put one on the side uh, I will fix that angle and I put them on the back had to bend them to shape and everything stick them on and starts coming together so now I'm going to drill the hole for the smoke box door handles. So you put on the kind of spiky bit first. <laughs> I'm sure there's a proper name, the dart. I'm not sure which way around it is, it, well, what it's called exactly. And then the little handles. And you kind of poke them on, and then I put a little bit of super glue on afterwards. And then it kind of sticks nicely. And then I put the second one on. And uh, all you do is when you put the second one on, I was a bit of glue on and then I, I snip off just above it file it um, and go from there but you see here I've got a bit of glue on there and it's gonna stop to going down all the way so I've got that sorted I snip it off it's only a bit of brass that comes off nice and easy and it's a bit spiky so we get the file out and we give it a gentle brush I don't want to damage anything and it just takes off the edge very very easily so that's nice and if you have to put another little bit of thin glue on there to hold it but it's coming together, it really is. Um, and as I've taken out the plastic coal load, which is one of my least favourite things on Locos, you see the coal loads always look terrible. On some Locos it looks alright. But I popped out on this one and I've made a little um, kind of bit to trap the coal for when I put mine in. Now I'm going to fit the Great Western Railway collet buffers. Um, it was a shame I couldn't get ones that looked just like the ones on a lot of those Locos. There's like a f small step um, on the top of them that I've seen from time to time and haven't managed to find that but I snip them off I use a knife to make them smooth and that's it goes on there then I ream out the holes with a taper reamer to make it the right size just take your time with this kind of thing and then after that bit of super glue and then they go on I felt that that square body of it is a little bit big um, because I don't know they seem a little bit oversized um, compared to some of the ones at my other models but they are nice, they are sprung buffers and fine. Um, I guess if I really wanted to, I could spend some time filing them down till they're about the right size, but they just fit in and that's that. Um, and they look nice. I've got no no issue with how they look and actually it's quite nice seeing all this brass on it. Um, that's one thing I like. Then we need to put the buffer bit in. 
and with that we have a spring which is held on by nuts we don't want to lose them I don't have any spares so we don't want that to be an issue <laughs> for us so we poke it in it's quite simple put it in and then there's a nut goes on the back and you do it up nice and tight so then it doesn't come undone but um, if you did have some worry I guess you could put a little bit of paint on the back of the thread and then it would never undo anyway but putting it together I use my tweezers on the nuts and I twist together um, well obviously spin it and it does the nuts up and that's it nice and simple you push it down and it does that I did however have to cut the front and make it fit the chassis properly which I'll show you shortly but no it's nice there's something nice about having sprung buffers uh, for some of you, you might think oh sprung buffers you know you're not going to notice it but I don't know it's a cool little novelty isn't it after that I was looking at the toolbox and the loco that I was basing this off looking in the books um, they had the toolbox sitting in the middle here whereas on the ones in the pictures they're sitting slightly further forward I've been told that's a difference between the 48s and the 58s so that's something that I need to obviously learn a little bit more about but I wanted to base off the ones in the pictures a bit more and go from there so here it is it's like that what I do need to do though is block them up so I've got some modeling clay well this is um, they call it green stuff because um, it goes green um, and it's two part I always use a little bit of water on my fingers when I mix these up otherwise it sticks to your fingers and you just can't get it off it's like it's just terrible it's like glue I then kind of poke it into position and yeah just manipulate it until it works out a bit all right in my head it's always going to go easier when it comes to it it's a pain I didn't particularly enjoy myself trying to, to do this right it wasn't the most easy going thing maybe if you some milli putty maybe that'd be easier I don't know um I couldn't get this as smooth as well I see people that do the the modeling for like the games workshop figures and various things and um they can do some fantastic sculpting with this stuff but I kind of struggle a bit if I'm honest thought I'd show off my mug I got this a couple of years ago from Digcock Railway and uh, it's very nice and it's got the 14XX on there um, looking up the 14XXs um, they were 58s and 48s I think the 48s didn't have the control where you can have it um, running with you know where they stand in the auto coach uh, whereas the 58s could uh, so I understand there's some differences there but those two um, eventually became F things as 48 XXs from what I'm understanding. But anyway, I've put on this kind of little spigot that sticks out the side of the smoke box, which normally has like something that looks like a tap on it. Um, but I didn't have that, so I put a little brassy thing on there, which actually I should paint gold. And I think on the, the model, I never bothered doing that in the end. So uh, maybe I can come back and do that sometime. But anyway, we stick on the, the vacuum pipes. I believe these are vacuum pipes. Um, and they have the little control box for the, um, you know, the so the driver again could go on the auto coach and he could control the loco, which was really cool. Um, I guess going back in time, it would have been great to see. I don't know how well it worked, how reliable it worked. I um, mean, must have been quite a fright if it didn't work. Um, but yeah, anyway, they just stick on with some nice thick glue, and that's it really. You can see that I've created some recesses in here, recesses, um, and this allowed for these sprung buffers to actually work. I was finding that, uh, well, I had no operation, um, so I had to make that happen. I've added a few more lamp irons, which is cool, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to polish this up. I'm going to use some brasso and some fine sandpaper, and I'll come back, and it'll be nice and shiny like this. And that'd be brilliant. So when I eventually varnish it and everything like that, it will have a natural metal look to it. And a bit of brasso um, and a bit of uh, thousand grit. Now I wanted to put some toolboxes back on it. And you know me, I like to do my 3D printing. And what I've got here is a toolbox. Not quite finished. I thought I'd carry on doing a bit of work in it for you to see. To put in the little line in for where the, the door comes up and everything. Uh, I use this CAD software for my work all the time and so you can get used to it and uh, these little boxes yeah you just go to the 3d printer you print them off and that's it so I have to save it as an STL file which is stereolithography I believe it creates all these little triangles 
and you get your toolbox you get it into your 3d printing software so it'll be on a resin printer and what i want to do is i want to first of all raise it up a number of millimeters um, i could have stuck it to the base but you get this thing called um, like an elephant's foot at the bottom so i try and make it so i got a nice edge and then i put these little supports on which kind of they don't feed it necessarily but it has to start somewhere and if you don't do that it tries to print it in kind of air and that's not going to do you any good because um, you won't get a print. It will just be a hard piece of resin floating around everywhere. Anyway, all you do is you copy and paste and you get a couple more of these sitting in there. So then I've got some that I can give to my dad if he wants to use them and this person myself. After that, they're printed and then I put them in a UV bath, I call it, and they're done. And it's nice and easy. Once they're done, you just break them out of the little legs that are on there. Um, they're quite fragile, there's little legs, so they're easy to come apart. I get some super glue, I go and put it on that, and that's it. I'm kind of happy. Um, it's nice, nice and fun. I'm incorporating old methods of modelling and some kind of, let's say, newer methods of modelling to get this done. When you've got ideas, like if I want to make that out of plastic card, I personally don't believe I could have made it better if I tried to make it out of plastic card. I'm sure there's some fantastic modelers out there that would do a very good job if they made it out of brass or, or whatever. But for me, this works and I'm happy. Obviously, whilst I'm here, I take a picture for Instagram so I can upload it. If you don't already follow my Instagram, check it out. It's just double O nil and you can see what projects I'm on. Normally about a good month before I'm doing it. Now I'm going to spray it okay so now i put blue tack under the steps and with that blue tack in place um that's going to just hold it still because i use a large nozzle and a bit of air pressure um i always find the models get knocked around a little bit so now it should be absolutely fine i have full access to all the angles whilst holding this piece of wood so it's good i use this bit of wood for all sorts so then I put a bit of airbrush thinner in, I get some primer, I'm using a, a grey primer, a light one, and obviously making it so it's not too thick, I get to spray it on and get nice smooth coats. The grey primer, it's in a view that whenever I paint Real Match Green on, if you paint white on it takes so much time to get through the, the white colour, it goes on so lightly coloured, um, I kind of feel like I need a primer with a dark green, I guess, I think Vallejo do a whole range of different color primers so i might have to get a green primer to make my life easier but i work my way around and we basically we primer everything Now with that stage done, I'm going to use my rail mesh, um, I think it's 1928 post green. I give it a very good shake for quite some time just to really make sure this paint works out. And I've thinned it down with flow improver. I'll end up doing about three coats, but basically looking at where it's still light green, I then need to keep painting until it gets darker. I find the pigment in the rail matches, it feels like it's quite weak compared to when I've used Vallejo. Vallejo I find if you're lucky you could do one coat and it's it's done and it's on there so i have been searching for a color that will match the great western green so it starts out quite a light color here and the more coats you do the darker and darker it gets maybe it's a technique that that's how it should be but i've got so used to some of the other paints out there it's always such a shame that this process takes so much longer um, and you have to put more and more paint on and then you start losing detail and that always irritates me when you lose detail but you can see here i've already done one coat i'm doing another coat and i just work my way through it until it's done now it's down to the black paint using my vallejo black i just paint it uh, the smoke box i'll be doing the top of the tanks the running plate and other little areas so we'll just get them done. The bit underneath the running plate, so to be careful that when I'm painting near the body that I don't make that 
black I'd like to try and separate it so I water my paints down quite a bit and this allows me to have I find better control on the brush it comes off a bit easier um, it just means I need to do maybe two coats it's the Vallejo paint so it works really well um, you'll find this and you get this nice coverage that never feels like you've gone too thick again with the red I'm using their flat red again by Vallejo it's all acrylic paints that I use and yeah I just work those areas with the red the pigment isn't obviously as strong as the black um, but I end up doing two coats and if there's anywhere that seems a bit weaker I come in with a third and eventually I'll be varnishing it but it's a nice vibrant red as you always see when you see these bits and uh, yeah so I've put it on again nice and thin and it looks th thick when I'm painting it um, but obviously when the water evaporates it all just works out nicely so it's honestly an enjoyable process during the red because it starts to bring the whole model together um, but at the same time it looks very bare um, you know we don't have any brassy bits on we don't have any transfers on there but it's come out alright I haven't lost you know let's say too much detail with the spraying um, and yeah we're going to put the thin whistle on as well as the one that came in the kit here's one of the ones that came in the kit they're quite chunky but when you look at them they have one big one and one small one and so I want to do that with this I don't know why the kit came with what well, the kit or the, the model came with two large ones I keep spotting just a big one and a small one um, and when you watch it for thunderbolts you'll you hear them it's got two different toots when it when it goes along Um, and obviously that must represent the two different types of uh, whistles that one there then we put the safety valves on the safety valve um, it looks great it's got a lovely brass look to it because it is brass I haven't had to paint this well, I'm in, all I'm going to end up doing is adding some satin varnish on it so that would be really really nice the nice thing about this whole model process is I've been able to do lots of different types of things I'm using some Fox transfers, um, water slide transfers. I normally use my press fix uh, transfers by HMRS, but they've not been in stock for a while. And basically, I've done not a bit of a editing here, but I left it for about a minute and a half. And that um, meant that it then separated itself from the um, transfer material that it was sitting on. Um, they've got these little legs that keep the distance apart quite nice um, you'll see on here and all I do is I end up just trimming them off with a knife and then I peel them away um, I actually didn't get all the footage of me doing this but once it's kind of settled um, and actually kind of dried quite a bit you can just run the knife on there and it comes away now another thing Fox transfers do is cab side plates and I can have some lovely genuine brass articles sitting on there which have been painted up and I don't have to do anything to them apart from stick them on and I use a bit of blue tack to hold the cab um, side plate because I've found that when I use tweezers it is always a bit harder to control and the tweezer ends up going into the body side so basically I use that blue tack and then I pull it off once it's glued a bit and then use my thumb to push it down but look at that it looks really nice doesn't it I'm really happy with it it still hasn't had a satin varnish coat so what we do is we do that now um, again I mix that up with the flow improver so then it doesn't block up on my airbrush I end up giving it I think I gave it two well I gave it two coats but I think I might have gone back over some areas to make a third coat and before I get started I always give it a good brush off otherwise you end up varnishing dust onto your model and that's just terrible or hairs or anything like that so you yeah, make sure you give it a brush before doing that clear it through the airbrush make sure that's working and now I work the area and already like when I'm spraying this on and it's starting to look shiny from just the glossy wetness of it it's starting to bring out the model's kind of beauty really the 14xx has always been in a loco that I've admired and the problem is I've not seen a proper model for it and I couldn't get hold of a Hatton's one but even if mine doesn't run I'd be happy with this because it just looks really really great so I work my way around and I give it two coats and what you'll find is when you do the first coat the red buffer ends they go slightly pinky and you might be thinking oh no like it's ruined it um, but then you do a second coat and it's fine 
Now, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm going to paint my men. And I stick them down now on a piece of wood because I find that they're hard to get a hold of. And so using a bit of activator and a bit th bit of thick super glue, they stick on here. And I can paint away without them falling over. I give them a quick primering with my primer. <laughs> um, just some white primer here by Vallejo again. Let that dry, let it go hard. And then what we want to do is mix up some blue. I use some Citadel paints here. This is, I think it's Cantor blue, this one. And I thin it down, thin it down quite a lot actually. So what you find, it will look like it's gone on here. Actually, there's a lot of paint there and all that kind of thing. Um, but it's been watered down. Um, and when that dries, you end up with loads of crisp detail and you can come back over, add another layer if you want, if you find the white's kind of still a bit too dominant on there. Um, so that's a process that I quite enjoy, honestly, um, painting the people for it. Um, I don't know how many of you are interested in painting the people would go inside, but there's not too many options for painted crew out there. I've always wondered why any companies haven't decided to offer to do that, you know. Um, I think P&D Marsh um, do uh, painted um, models um, as well as their white metal models. I haven't looked to see if they do painted crew because that would be very handy. Um, I better go and check that out actually. So yeah, check out P&D Marsh. They do a lot of nice uh, models. These ones are Monty's models um, um, crew. This is the left hand drive crew, uh, which I'm currently dry brushing at the moment. Um, if you want to get any Monty's models items, I get mine through Dark Castings. Um, he lists, or they list a lot of them. Uh, basically, give them a little dry brush to pick out those little details on there. And then I want to paint the hair onto them. I went for a brighter colour. Um, so it's more of a, a gingery colour on this one. So then when I put the skin tone on it, it will actually darken up slightly. You can see it's quite a bit brighter there. But now I'm adding on the skin tone. And um, it's a Gulliman Flesh um, contrast paint, which you put on um, the whites. And actually it picks out all the details in the dark and the bits that are on top, it's a bit brighter. It always looks like a dirty kind of skin colour that they've been in a steam engine driving it for hours. Um, so I quite like that and uh, it looks quite smart. Um, and after that I just add a little gloss coat to the hats because they had shiny hats, right? Might be wrong but I see in the pictures they have little shiny hats uh, on there. After that I add in the coal. And I always enjoy this process. It's like one of the finishing processes, the, the sign off. Uh, once this is done, it's ready to go back on the chassis. And yeah, it's going to be great. We might do some other things yet. You'll see very shortly. So obviously I put the glue in. And after that, very simply, I put the coal in. And I have a fun time shoveling it. So I keep shoveling and shoveling and shoveling and shoveling. And then that's it really. Um, I then organise it, make sure you might have to put a little bit in here and there. But then I use isopropyl alcohol and I drop that in. This will stop the watered down super glue, super glue, <laughs> PVA glue um, from welling up at the top and leaving, yeah, just unrealistic looking blotches of whiteness. So I drop it in here and you can see it just wicks in really, really nicely. Let that dry and not a drop falls out when I turn it upside down. So it's a process that I've enjoyed. So that will then dry and it looks smart. Look at that. I left that overnight, came back in the morning and it looks good. It looks really good and uh, something I'm happy with. So we break these guys off the bit of wood. There they are. The feet don't break off, but if they did, I wouldn't see it anyway. Because when they sit in here, they hang out the side. You only see the top half. You think, well, why did I even paint their legs? But you never know. I might use them for something else one day. But here it is. I'm going to put it on the chassis. Nice and simple, nice and easy. And we're going to put some Great Western Railway um, lamps on, which are by Springside. So check them out. You can get them from various places. But stick the lamps on and then some spare ones on the side for if they need it for various other duties that they might be doing. Kind of like this. I saw this in some of the pictures and I thought, oh, I've got to do that too. Then Springside models again use their bucket and their shovel from that kit. Really excited to have a bucket to put on. I like the idea of that. So we drop that bucket on there and then the shovel, nice and simply, it does go in the side. Um, a little bit, little bit tricky actually when you poke this down, um, but we get that in. And to glue it in, I'm just going to use one dub of glue really, maybe two, um, one on each end to hold it in. So use a little bit there and then I kind of poke it up and over. So 
put it on the bottom end of it and then just let it sit on one fire iron and then it sticks on there so that's nice trying to bend it but that's it it's looking smart and i'm honestly really really proud of it um, you should do this yourselves if you've got one of these i took some pictures of it i was really really happy of how they turned out um, i went to a field i took my test track with me and i took some shots and I was really happy. My driver looks happy as well. He's looking out thinking it's a lovely day today, isn't it? An item that I didn't cover is the windows. And I should have done something for that. But I kind of keep forgetting about that. So it means it isn't too important to me. If I was to do this again, there's a couple of areas that I'd improve. I would um, do a better job at the, the wheel arches because um, I didn't get them perfectly smooth and the handrails and the sides they weren't as good as they could be um yeah so i think windows are the main thing anyway so that's that anyway i just want to say a huge thank you to all the support that i get from my patrons and my channel members you've all been great very encouraging and without your help i probably wouldn't have that motivation to do this and i probably couldn't afford to do all of this the way that i do it so i must say thank you to you um, if you do, would like to become a patron or a channel member, the links are below. But if not, become a subscriber. You'll get to see everything that I do and hopefully some of the things that I do will help you in your search to become slightly better at this hobby if you're kind of more of a beginner. Whereas if you're a lot better than me, then maybe leave me a comment below and explain to me some areas that I can improve because I always appreciate the comments, even if they aren't so positive, um, but try and make them a little bit positive for me. But anyway, thank you so much again. Um, I'm looking forward to doing more locos like this and making them nice. Anyway, you take care, look after yourselves, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Yeah. <sighs>